Welcome to Nata's presentation on cause analysis. The aim of this presentation is to introduce you to a process on how to approach cause analysis and an infographic that has been created as a aid memoir and summary of the process. So what is cause analysis? It's a systematic analysis that seeks to uncover the fundamental, underlying or initial causes of an incident, failure or problem. And there are multiple approaches that has seen over the, over the last few years. Um, the five whys is very popular. The fishbone affinity fault tree allows you to look at all the inputs. There are also Pareto and barrier analysis. And so we will look at a couple of those examples now. So the five whys, as you can see from the diagram, you're asked five questions and within those five questions, you should come to the ultimate answer. So if you're caught speeding, you were late for work, you got up late because your alarm clock didn't work, the batteries were dead, you forgot to replace them. So what was the ultimate cause? Similarly, this is a bit more complicated, uh, takes a bit more time, but as I said, um, these things are fit for purpose. You can choose which procedure to use. So you may choose to analyze more complex problems in this manner. I'll just leave it up there on the screen. So what's uh, 17011? That's the standard that accreditation bodies are accredited to. And we are examined by our colleagues, our fellow ABs on our four year rotation under the mutual recognition agreement. Um, 17011 requires that an accreditation body assess the accredited facility's cause analysis and their subsequent corrective action. So there's a few things we've seen um, since we've been uh, since NATO has been looking at this that are not correct, and so that's why we've thought to um, produce this uh, presentation for you. The first thing is that restating the non-conformity is not cause analysis. It's a bit like using the question, repeating the question in your answer. It doesn't work. It didn't work at school. It doesn't work now. The original finding must clearly state the non-conformity and be correctly coded. So we come to our diagram. Now, this does look like a road because it is a bit of a journey. And you see we've put the five wires in there as roundabouts. There are two questions and three tips, and I will now explore each of those points. This will be made available with the presentation. So the first question is, is there a clear, clear relationship between the cause of the nonconformity and the potential effects? You really have to link the two things. Um, so you need a description of what's been happening. Um, you can't do everything, of course, so you, you do as good as you can, so we can understand and you can understand at the end of the day. I mean, really, the cause analysis is for you to improve your processes. We're just observing what you've done and making a, a finding as to whether or not you've addressed the matter. So the identified cause must link to the nonconformity. And if the cause has been correctly addressed, we would assume that it's the root cause. You have to, we make an assumption there that it's the root cause. We don't ask to see a root cause analysis. And as a result of that, you will not see the nonconformity reoccur. The second question is, is the cause of the nonconformity and the potential consequences clear and sufficiently detailed? Pretty straightforward question. Again, it asks you as the facility to examine the issue and come up with a justified reason for your selection of the cause. And the other important thing is there that the facility must ensure that the associated consequences of the cause have been considered. So there may, there may be other related matters that, that, that arise with an issue. So you, you need to sort of um, look further than the issue itself and make sure you haven't missed any opportunities for improvement. And there are three tips, human error. Now this is quite a common um, response um, to a problem. Somebody didn't do it. But just saying that someone didn't do it is not necessarily, or it was a one-off, or it was just you know a mistake that day, is not necessarily um, acceptable. There are probably odd occasions where it might occur, but in most instances, there will be an underlying cause um, and you need to further explore why the human error occurred. 
Proceeding causes for human error can be both in the management system, e.g. the procedure didn't actually explain what to do, or resource-related. There was inadequate staffing, lack of supervision, um, overwork, those type of things. A staff member is loading, so there's an example here of that, So, start, and this is a real example. So a staff member is loading samples into a 96 well ELISA, not that complicated. And the procedure requires for loading and preparing the plates in a specific way so that you get a randomised pattern including the controls. And that's part of your inbuilt quality control. Now the staff member takes a break, or could be distracted in this instance, takes a break whilst loading the tray. And they don't take good care to mark where they were up to on the plate. As a result, when they come back, they start, they, they make an error and they miss the controls. And as, and, and as a result of that, the entire plate will then um, fail later on. A procedural violation. If the initial investigation indicates a procedural violation in, is a contributing factor, you need to further explore this and understand the underlying causes. Accepting the cause of a procedural violation only results in an action to remind if, if it only results in an action to remind staff to follow the procedure, then you really will only have had minimal impact. You've got to work out why, what resulted in the lack of following the procedure. Failure to perform a task can be quite common. Um, Failure to perform a task can only be considered the cause where responsibility has been assigned. So you actually have to say, well, John, you need to do that. And you need to do it on Tuesdays at two o'clock. If John doesn't do it Tuesdays on two o'clock, then you can say, well, John failed to um, perform that task as designated. Otherwise, um, it's very difficult to say, well, you were required to do it at two o'clock. Um, half past two, who's to say it was two o'clock was important. And avoid assignment of individual blame. Yes, someone has usually done something, but often there's some underlying causes that um, result in the effect you see, and, and the person themselves are not the cause. Corrective action. Now, this, this um, presentation is around cause analysis, but the two things go hand in hand. We've got corrective action and cause analysis. The principles we're considering cause analysis, they also apply to corrective action. And you need to be looking to address the original nonconformity. If you don't just find the root cause, again, we don't refer specifically to root cause here, but it's difficult to consider a successful outcome in investigating a cause analysis or a corrective action if you have not identified the root cause. So you need to look further into your issue and make sure you are at the, at the earliest um, point in, in, the, in the process that you can identify. And you need to see a clear link again between the non-conformity and the cause, and between the cause and the corrective action. And if you do this all correctly, and really this is for you of course, it improves your process. It, 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 is, it sounds a bit trite, but every failure is an opportunity to improve, and you are encouraged to do the best job you can. Um, our staff were there to help you, um, you can work through it, but I think we've found that there's patterns in this um, and often the same thing repeats itself. It may be a slightly different scenario. And in those instances, you really need to look a bit deeper into the process and try and identify the root cause. Now, the infographic and this presentation will be available on our website for, for the foreseeable future. And um, if you need any further information, I suggest you contact your client coordinator or another member of NATA staff and have a discussion about the matter at your next assessment. Thank you for your attention.